behave yourself, Jaws. Today should be fun. I'm going to cut a piece of beautiful dark orange citrine called Santa Anta Madeira Citrine. I'm going to cut it into a trillion design using a design from one of my all-time favorite gem fastening design creators. I'm going to pack a lot of what I believe to be useful information into this video, including demonstrating how to use a gem saw blade on the Altertech fasting machine, a special secret about the World Wide Web that allowed me to retrieve dozens of lost gem cutting designs, and unfortunately I will show you how to work through a typical disaster that can occur when cutting a gemstone because, yes, I had a problem with this gemstone. So let's get to it. Madeira Citrine is a dark reddish brown variety of citrine. The origin of the name Madeira citrine is disputed, but one view is that Madeira citrine was named after the famous Madeira wine produced in the Madeira Islands off the coast of Portugal. Madeira citrine has the same color as Madeira wine. This unique wine has been the most important export of the Madeira Islands since around the 1700s when ships from Europe bound for the Americas would stop off at the islands and top off on barrels of Madeira wine for the long journey. Gem experts estimate that only 2% of all citrine mined is Madeira colored, which makes Madeira citrine the rarest type of all citrine. Gem cutters also generally agree that the best source of Madeira citrine is in Uruguay. And no, there is no Madeira citrine being mined in the Madeira Islands. In fact, I used to make annual buying trips to the Minas Gerais region of Brazil. This state or province of Minas Gerais translates to general mines because of the large number of gemstone mines that were in operation in that province or state during the colonial period. There used to be, and maybe still is, an annual gem show in the small city of Teofilo Otoni. And it was during one of my buying trips to Teofilo Otoni many years ago that I met a pair of miners up from Uruguay and I purchased as many large, clean, beautifully col colored pieces of Madeira citrine as I could afford, which wasn't all that many. This Madeira citrine comes from their mine in the Cantera Santa Anta region of Uruguay. This specific type of Madeira citrine is called Santa Ana Madeira citrine because of the mine location. Each piece that I bought had an incredibly blazing orange color. Then I put my treasured rough into my foot locker with all the other growing number of pieces of rough that I planned to cut. And then voila, a mere 15 plus years later, and it's on to the dot for cutting. Do any of you other cutters have the same speedy process from purchase of the rough to finished stone, or is it just me? You will sometimes see gem rough dealers selling Madeira citrine or even Santa Ana Madeira citrine and describing it as source from Brazil. This tracks with my experience. The Uruguay miners that I met all those years ago would bring their awesome rough to the annual gem show in Teofilo Otoni, Brazil, because it was the only show in the region. So yeah, if one of the Jeff, if one of our rough dealers is still going to Teofilo Otoni, they will probably find my two friends from Uruguay who are selling Santa Ana Madeira Citrine from Uruguay. But I guess it is appropriate to say sourced from Brazil, especially if you can't speak either Spanish or Portuguese. If anyone knows if the gem show in Teofilo Otoni is still being conducted every year, please let me know in the comments. I may be up for that long trek of an adventure next year or in the near future. After selecting the piece of rough I will facet, I used my trim saw to cut the stone in half as it was a whopper to start with. I'll spend more time on showing you trimming of rough in another video. I'm really having to squeeze the bottles hard to get this epoxy to flow. Also for the second bottle I notice that the epoxy is slightly brownish 
When the bottles were new and first opened, about two years ago now, both bottles were clear and the fluid flowed easily, almost like water. I don't know if epoxy goes bad or not, but since the cost is minimal, I will put getting new epoxy on my shopping list for my next visit to Home Depot. I'll write the date on my future epoxy bottles to remind me to replace them after about a year or so. Again, I have no idea if the age of epoxy will have any effect on the adhesion to the stone. If anyone has any experience with this issue, please tell us in the comments. Now that the stone is on our dock, I'm going to show you how to use an optional piece of equipment that you can get with your Altertac fasting machine, V2 or V5. The facet saw adapter runs $55 and the saw blade, you can choose either a 0.012 inch thick or a 0.006 inch thick saw blade. The blades run another $44 for a total of $99. Or you can buy the facet saw kit, which has an adapter and a 0.006 inch blade for $90. I took the kit option and saved a few dollars. I expect this kit will work on most other fasting machines, but I have not tested this and do not know for sure. If any of you have tried running a saw on your fasting machine, please let us know your results in the comments section. Here is the diagram we are going to cut. This diagram was created by the late Jeff Graham. The instructions tell us to cut the first three cuts of the pavilion or bottom half of the gemstone into a center point at an angle of 45.85 degrees. So we set our angle indicator to 45.85 degrees and we cut at the 96 tooth of the 96 index, then at the 32 tooth and the 64 tooth. Okay, so we have our stone set in the dock, kind of ready to make a triangle out of it. We have our Ultratech saw blade in place. We have the dial indicator set for the first angle for the first set of cuts, 45.85, and the indicator gear tooth of 96. So we're gonna make three cuts, the 96, the 32, and the 64, and that should give us a little triangle. So instead of trying to grind the stone, we're gonna use the saw blade. And instead of using my trim saw, which would be very hard for me to try to do it at the angle that the gem cutting diagram says, would be very hard for me to do. So we're gonna give it a try. Slow, steady pressure on the stone. First cut is made. The second cut is at 32 degree or 32 index. We don't have to adjust the height at all. And the third cut will be at the 64 index gear tooth. Okay, so the gem cut diagram wants you to make the initial three cuts to a temporary center point at 45.85 degrees. So instead of grinding all those down to meet that temporary center point, we've done it with the saw. There you have it. So I'll spin dry the blade so it doesn't rust and put it away for another day. Now I'll share with you the history of how I first got this diagram. Jeff Graham he had intended to keep this design secret and only cut it himself, but just before one Christmas many, many years ago, our friend Jeff released this design to the public so all gem cutters could try it. It was freely downloadable on his website, which was then called facetors.com. Sadly, Jeff passed away, and when he passed, his website was taken down. All the links to his free gem fasting designs were cut, and if you type in fasters.com today, you get taken to a different site, which is related to gems, but Jeff's site is gone. So at that time, I lost access to dozens of designs that Jeff had created. And when I was a relatively new gem cutter, I almost exclusively used Jeff's designs. Uh, Jeff did a, a superb job of explaining his designs and giving new cutters pointers on areas of where to pay special attention to when cutting, where to where to slow down so you don't overcut a facet, tips like that. And plus, his designs always resulted in beautiful gemstones. Fortunately, there's a saying that the internet never forgets. Well, guess what? It's true. So all those lost designs that Jeff Graham created and then gave to the gem cutting community, and then we all lost, well, I'm going to show you how you can retrieve them. So the first thing we need to do to retrieve Jeff's diagrams is we need, well, a time machine. 
Okay, maybe not exactly like this one, but what we do have for a time machine is called the Wayback Machine, which is a digital archive of the World Wide Web. To access our time machine, go to https colon backslash backslash archive dot org backslash web backslash. Now, I don't know what all the knobs, levers, and buttons do on this time machine here, but I do know to type in the old URL, fasteners.com, and hit the browse history button. And this is what comes up. Now we just need to pick a date when new that all the designs were actually in that website. Seems to me it was around 2006, so I'll pick someday in 2006 and see what happens. So next, click on 2006, and the calendar for 2006 pops up with the dates that saves were made of this website. So I'm just going to randomly guess here. Um, so I'll pick 18 January and see what we see. Then I'll click on any of these save times and voila, we are back in 2006. Now you can go anywhere you like and explore all around January 18, 2006. Enjoy, enjoy your exploring and don't worry, you will not create a temporal paradox and you won't destroy the entire galaxy. Now seriously, if you look under Fastening Designs, Index of Fastening Designs, you will see a list of Jeff's free designs. There are several more designs and I believe you can see them all by clicking on Fastening Designs. Looks like there are about a total of 40 free fasting designs on this page. All you need to do is click on any design name and the gem cutting design will come up. You download it directly from 2006 onto your computer of today. So we will be cutting Jeff's signature number four design. I guess it's time to go back to the present, but wait a minute. You go ahead. I'll meet you back in the present shortly. I want to stop off first while I'm back in 2006 and buy some lottery tickets. See you soon. Okay, so now we're going to work on the girdle with a 320 grit. Okay, and we'll go all the way around with our girdle. Okay, I finished preforming our citrine with the 320 grit diamond lap and there's a little bit further to go on the 96 index grit right here. You can see it, it's still flat on the girdle, which means I haven't quite preformed or cut on that. What will happen is I'll cut the two indexes next to it and it'll cut into kind of a V. So we've got a little further to go. It's right there. So this is almost the size of the final stone. It'll be a little bit smaller as I cut that piece, but I should have no problem getting 15. Right now it's almost 17 millimeter, just a little bit short, and Bopi wants a 15 millimeter, so I should be able to get it. Now I'll cut all the facets again with the 600 grit and then the 1200 grit, and then we'll go to polish. I've finished cutting all the facets on the citrine with a 600 grit topper and now we'll go to the 1200 grit and we'll use a 1200 grit crystallite. So up until the 600 I'm fine with going ahead and using the cheaper kind of discs but now that we're moving to the 1200 I use a crystallite quality disc and then we'll move into the polish. Finished cutting the citrine with the 1200 crystallite lap. Now I'm going to move to a polish with cerium oxide. So the cerium oxide ultra laps are a disposable multi-use lap. And of course it needs a backing. You just put a couple of drops of water you're gonna use for the backing for your ultra laps and that holds them in place. So we're all ready to go to polish. Okay, we finished polishing the pavilion at the bottom half of the citrine. So now I'm going to put it in the transfer jig and I'm going to use Loctite 404 super glue to glue it to the transfer and get ready to cut the top part or the crown. And you have to move the uh, transfer jig around a little bit while it's setting so that the glue does not run down the dock or the stone. And we'll let that harden up and then we'll cut the crown or the top half of the stone. Okay, so we've put our 
citrine in the uh, citrine in the top into the spindle and uh, now we want to make sure we've got it lined up right so what we do is we have at the 96 angle there's a facet on the girdle from when we fasted at the pavilion so we put our dial indicator to 90 degrees and we want that facet that we cut for the pavilion at the 96 degree or the 96 index we want that to be just touching and perfectly level so you have to as you raise it you want to make sure you've got that perfectly flush with this tool that comes from Ultratech. So it's perfectly flat. So our 96 facet is perfectly aligned. That means we can cut the crown without any problems. So uh, we'll start the crown with 42 degrees at the 96 index. So we've set our degrees to 42. And now we will cut at the 96 angle until we have ground down to a 0.3 between a 0.3 and 0.5 width of our girdle. So I use one of these steel gauge, wire gauge width tools that you can get at an auto shop. And I've marked 0.3 millimeters, which is right there. So it's the gap. The gap right there is 0.3 millimeters. You can go 0.5, the gap there. It's not much of a gap. So that's how thick your girdle, again, could be. It's a topic of debate. You don't want no girdle or, or this jeweler will chip it when they're setting. It. So generally between 0.3 and 0.5 millimeters. That's what we're aiming for. Catastrophe when the stone comes off. So I'll have to re-glue it and continue on. Fortunately the stone wasn't damaged when it came off the dop, but that's what happened. So I'll have to re-glue it to the dop and carry on from there. Okay, we're not going to use our Loctite on this one. Instead I'm going to use my 5 minute 2 part epoxy. JB Weld because I want to get lots of adhesive on the stone and the dot so that it doesn't come off again. So the good news is I've got lots of girdle left to cut with. As long as I can line it up the stone properly I'll be okay. I've used a very oversized dot here in the top so that helps me line up and center the stone because there's very little sticking out. So it helps me make sure I've got the stone centered. If I used a smaller dot it'd be hard to center but now I can see it's just touching over the edges here. There's only any tip a little bit so I pretty well got it centered so now we mix our epoxy and then set it make two little puddles of epoxy side by side those look to be about equal so it's only once you start mixing it that you have to get it set starts that activates the epoxy so you want to mix it up real good you have a couple of minutes sure we've still got it about centered best we can get it okay I just removed our citrine trillion from the transfer jig at where I reset the stone into the dop. I used two-part epoxy and a lot of it. Again, I'm thinking it was because the, the dop come in three styles. There's a round, there's a V-shape, and there's a flat. There isn't one really made for just trillions. And I'm thinking the trillion shape at the bottom, just there wasn't enough surface touching the dop for the, for the adhesive to hold, which happens sometimes. So uh, I think using two-part epoxy is the answer, or uh, reverse the cutting and cut the crown first, and then when you transfer it, you're gonna have a flat dot adhesive adhering to the, t the crown. That might be another option. Or just consider it one of those things that rarely happens, but happens once in a while, and not worry about it. So now that it's back in the dot, we're ready to continue where we are. We have to make sure that we are uh, in alignment. So based on our, our signature number four diagram, at the 96 index, there's a flat facet, three places around the girdle. And we want to make sure that we're flat at the 96 tooth, 96 index. So we put it at 96. We put the degrees down to 90 degrees, which is flat. We have our flattest lap here uh, to set things on and a piece of metal that is flat and flush. And now what we do is we just put the stone and we lower it until it just touches. And we check that 96, that flat facet is touching the metal flat surface here and when you raise up the armature you should watch and you should just see it break contact with this metal and you'll see a little bit of space between it and you need to make sure that space is even and if it is you're back in alignment so that's where we want to be 
Now, we still could be out of alignment because when we reset the stone, we may maybe did not set it flat. Maybe it's off a little bit. I don't know that for sure, but I can check for it. So the 96 is a, has a flat facet, the 96 index. The 32 and the 64 index also have the flat girdle facets. So at 32, we should see the same thing. And at 64, so it's lined up. It still could be it's not flat. I don't know, but when I start cutting, I will see that. And if it is the case, then instead of cutting three facets for this tier and then two tiers of six facets, I'll have to do each of the three sides individually. So I could still work around it. I'm hoping that it was flat when we reset it. I believe it was. We took our time and did it right, but we'll see. So we're back in business and back to cutting our crown. I'll start out with a 600 grit just for a second to get a little further down. Fortunately, we have a long ways to go to reach the girdle. And you can see that here. The girdle width is very wide, so which is good. It gives us a lot of room to work with. I'm glad the stone popped off the dot at that stage rather than after we had the girdle all set at 0.3 millimeters. So I'll try it with the 600 now to make sure that, that the stone is still aligned. And then we'll go to the 1200, maybe an 8000 to pre-polish and then polish with the uh, cerium oxide. Okay, so after we cut the first three facets, the 96, 32, and 64, and made it flat, or brought down the girdle a little bit, I just wanted to see if I'm still in alignment. The next tier is also cut at the 42 degree angle, but that's with the six facets, the three, 29, 35, 61, 67, and 93 facets, one on each side of the first facets we cut. And when you cut those, like the three here, you see that the the line moves right here, and when that lines up with the line on the girdle between the 96 and the 3 facet, you should have a flat girdle, which we have, up until the next facet on the outside, which I'll have to cut later, is the next set of instructions. So our girdle line is coming along fine so far with the 3. Now next is the 29. So we're already lined up. So this cut will tell us if when we reset our stone in the transfer jig, if we got it not quite right or if we got it right. So we'll find out here with this cut because it's already set up for the 3 index and now we're cutting with the 29 index at the same same level so when we hit 20 42 degrees right there if we did everything right with our transfer jig we should see the line here this is between the 32 and the 29 in this case the line here matches the line on the girdle so that's good and we have a flat girdle line all the way across these two facets so Looks like we were lucky and are in alignment. I'll go ahead and cut the rest of these six facets and then, then we'll know for sure. I mean, I don't think anything's out of alignment, but we'll, we can find out rather quickly. So I've cut the three and the 29. So now it's the 35, 61, 67, and 93. And again, we are using the 600 grit, diamond grit topper lap, cutting it to a 42 degree angle for this tier. That's aligned, 61 tooth, 61 index tooth is right there. 61's in alignment, and then there's the 67. And the 93 index tooth. Okay, so after cutting the C1 and C2, two tier of indexes on the crown, we are in alignment. We were lucky when the stone fell off that it fell off after we had already pleated all the tiers. So when we reset it, it was nice and balanced and it is in balance. We we'll should not have any problems uh, cutting the rest of the stone uh, unless Mother Nature throws something else at us. Stay tuned for that. We have uh, finished polishing everything except the table. Now I'm going to spin dry my lap. Now we will set up our stone for the table. So the way we do that is we remove the stone and the dot from the Ultratech machine. And we remove this uh, brass set screw. The Ultratech machine has a handy little place right here to put this, this set screw in. You just put it in there a little ways and that way you don't lose it. And then for cutting the table, you need a 90 degree angle. So you use this table adapter by Ultratech. You put your Ultratech at the degree indicator at 45. 
and when we put on our adapter, so our, our spindle's at 45 degree and our adapter is already a 45 degree adapter, so that will give us the 90 degrees we need. And this little tool here, it acts as your DOP and it makes sure that your table adapter is not uh, to either side, so it's flat. And again, we can get it at 45 degrees. We just tighten it down. There's two set screws in the table adapter. You set those with your Allen wrench and then your stone goes in. I like to leave enough room for my fingers to fit in, but you can set your dop anywhere you want in the table adapter. And we're ready to cut the table. We have a little bit to remove, so I'll start with the 600 and then go to the 1200. And I may use the 8000 or may not, depends on how that goes before I polish again with serum oxide. So I finished polishing the citrine trillion, and we'll take it out of the 45 degree table adapter and uh, soak it in acetone to get the epoxy off and we'll weigh it and measure it and send it off to Popey's. She has a custom weight on it. In this video, I demonstrated using a trim saw blade on a fasting machine. I showed you how to go back in time on the internet and recover some lost gem facet diagrams. And I demonstrated one method to try to recover from a stone falling off the dock. Hope you enjoyed the video. Happy faceting.